On the morning of August 1, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And you're listening to Stop the Killing. So hi, Liz. We're so glad to have you here today. Can you tell our audience who we are graced to be with today? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, My name is Elizabeth Stout. I am 23 and I am currently getting my master's degree with the University of Florida in mass communication, hence why I'm starting my own podcast now called Trigger Therapy, and it's just entirely on candid conversations of what life can look like after gun violence. I was a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I went there in 2014, and I graduated in 2018. I'm excited to talk to you today, and maybe we could maybe pop in here who else is with us we can't she's silent on the line but sarah's with us hi sarah sorry i'm multitasking with builders in the background so i will make sure that mute is my friend today can i call you liz right everybody calls you liz so we talk so much about the shootings and what leads up to the shootings and how we might be able to prevent them but when i worked with the fbi one of the things that i was concerned about, and I knew surprisingly little about, was the victim recovery. Even though as a prosecutor, we had victim services people who worked in our courthouses, and even as an agent with the FBI, we had a whole victim services team. I really didn't focus on that a lot because I was always running after the bad guy. I wasn't really thinking, oh, how does this impact people? And I'm really kind of ashamed to say that, but that's the truth. I didn't think as much about it. So maybe instead of saying what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, I could say to you, what are you comfortable talking about and how should people ask you? I always like when people will ask what they don't push because there's a difference because sometimes I'm very broad in that, okay, I live in the D.C. area now and someone's like, well, what brought you there? I'm very politically motivated. Well, what topic? of politics is making you really motivated. Gun reform. Well, why is that? What, how'd you get into that? And so it'll just keep pushing. And that kind of stuff, it's like, all right, take the hint. Like, I'm being as broad as possible. Other times, <laughs> I have people who will be very sensitive and they just know the boundaries and can just read the room. But the idea behind the podcast is what you were saying. is that Gun violence can be a very abstract, statistical concept. And it can be a little desensitizing, especially in America. And I want to just bring those stories to light. And, you know, my dad was also a special agent in the FBI for about 22 years. So he didn't really know what being a victim of gun violence was like until his family was affected. I mean, right. so it, it's just until it happens to you, then, then you understand. But I think explaining the details and nuances of what goes on makes people really remember that this is a public health issue and that not only people are getting killed, but people survive, but then they have to live with it for the rest of their lives. And if they don't have the adequate resources that my family and I had, then they can just be stuck and just live a really sad and unsustainable type of lifestyle. So when you talk about your experience with people, so for instance, as you indicated, you're active politically. Do you always think that it's important then that you have to share maybe more than you want to share? Yeah. Sometimes I'll I'll definitely make myself a little exhausted. I'll suddenly forget my own boundaries because I want people to know that it's not just a shooting. Like it's it's just it's not that. There's so much more involved and it's human lives. And the fact that we were kids in high school and the fact that we've even had Sandy Hook happened. It's just like, this is such a foreign concept that we are going to school and then we're getting shot at. Why is life moving on? Why are we still just doing nothing about it? And that's just, it boggled my mind because it was five years ago for me, but I still can't wrap my head around the fact that it happened in the first place. So answer this if you want and don't if you want, and that's perfectly fine. 
But can we back up and can you just explain to the audience what happened to you and others over at the school? Absolutely. So Marjorie Stone Douglas is in Parkland, Florida, and it's campus made up of 13 buildings, about 45 acres. And the biggest building on campus is called the 1200 building. The 1200 building is also known as the freshman building because there's majority of freshman class in that building. It holds about 900 students. And I had my final class of the day in that building. I had AP psychology and I was on the first floor and my classroom was kind of smack in the middle of the hallway. So when we heard gunshots, it was 20 minutes till the bell was going to ring and we heard gunshots go off and it was very slow, like two or three slow bangs but it was the echo and it was so loud and i couldn't tell what side of the hallway he was on west or east but obviously my dad and i had gone shooting before and so i just knew right away those were gunshots and everyone kind of just stood up at the same exact time in my classroom and we all ran to the wrong side of the classroom so our classrooms across Stone Douglas had glass panels in the classroom doors and we ran across so we were facing the door and so we were just in the wrong spot and we were there for about one or two three seconds until my teacher said this is the wrong side of the room go to my desk so all 30 of us about run over to the side of the room that shares the teacher's desk and the door. So if we were behind her desk and kind of looped around it in the shape of an L, you wouldn't be able to see anything if you're the shooter trying to look in the classroom through that glass panel. So he's just, it's, he's shooting and the walls are vibrating and it's the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. And like my body's shaking, but I am telling myself that this is just a really, really, really effed up drill. And because this is this is Parkland like this, this wouldn't happen here. And obviously my gut saying one thing, I'm, my brain trying to tell me something else. And I remember I was looking at my classmate nearby me and I said, should I call my dad? Should I call my dad? And no one was really answering. Everyone was kind of like, what is that? Kind of getting increasingly more nervous. And then 90 seconds into the shooting, he shoots into my classroom and hit four kids those kids were just left over out of the l so they were just too exposed out of that l shape in between the podium and the teacher's desk and i didn't know that people were hit obviously i knew the room was shot into because there was just debris everywhere and kids were screaming and then after he kept walking west down the first floor hallway the kids in my classroom were reacting and we're making weird noises and begging for help. And my brain again is like, it's just an asthma attack. It's just an asthma attack. They're okay. And we're there for about 20 minutes until first responders come into our classroom to get us out. But in that entire 20 minutes, I was just talking to my friends and family. And then there was my teacher and a 16-year-old boy at the time just took it upon themselves to just tend to the injured. And by the time we got out, police had escorted us out. And after those 20 minutes, I stood up for the first time and I just looked over the desk and that was where everyone was that was hit. And they had already taken out two injured kids. And so they left behind the girl that was killed. Her name is Carmen Shentrup and another girl who was injured. And so I'm just staring. And it's like, I can't move. I'm just frozen because I can't believe what I'm looking at. And it's to the point where the, the police are just like, get out, come out of the room. And so we're all kind of like pushed out. And my friend and I are just jogging out of the room together. And we're stepping over glass. We're getting into the hallway that was just, when I walked in, it was so lively and right. So many students, Valentine's Day's balloons and chocolates and candies, and then exiting the hallway. It was just so smoky. There was just bullet holes riddled through the wall, magazines on the floor, 
the laptop the girl that was killed in the hallway was there that she was using the kids that were killed in the hallway were laying side by side it was just hell it was just it was hell and my brain was just like what is happening because when i came in here it was so innocent and when i'm leaving this is war this is a war zone My friend and I jog out together. And by the time I get outside, my dad was already at the scene. My mom was already there. And I had just waited about an hour, about like 3.45. My dad finished working and he and I left and went home. But it was the most surreal day of my life because it's one thing where you have communities that are just overwhelmed with gun violence and like Chicago, for example, those kids just grow up knowing that. And the fact that that's normalized at all is bizarre to me. But then Parkland is just a very safe place. Like if someone lost their phone, it would be given to the front office to say, give this back to the person that this belongs to. It was just very safe. And I spent more time at school than I did at home because I was so involved with cheerleading in yearbook and academics. And I eventually stopped going to Stoneman Douglas and I transitioned online and obviously I grieved the 17. I grieved what happened in that room, but I was also incredibly upset that I felt like the life that I built and knew was essentially robbed from me, from institutions at the local to federal level who played a part and failed everybody at that school, everybody in that community. Do you feel, Liz, that you're kind of two people now? Are you kind yes. of the person who, do you know what I'm, I think Absolutely. you said yes right I, away, so you must know what I mean. Because in therapy, I was really grieving my old self. I wanted the old Liz because the old Liz was very extroverted. She had so many friends. She never second-guessed her self-esteem, her self-confidence. And she was just happy that she just lived her life. And then after the shooting happened, I didn't really know who I was anymore. I didn't really like to do any of the things I used to like. I also just lived in constant fear. And my nervous system was just always amped. And I just felt really amped all the time. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. And then six months after the shooting, I went to the University of Florida, where in retrospect, I should not have gone to college at that time. I don't know how I went. but. I feel like going to college in that short amount of time made healing so much harder. And I think that it made the old Liz and new Liz divide a lot more amplified and intense. But through internal family systems therapy with my psychologist, it took me three or four years to kind of move past that grief and have the self-compassion to just love myself of who I became after that shooting. Is it hard to be the new Liz? Now it's not. I would say maybe two years ago, I was still kind of uncomfortable in my own body with my identity. But I feel like, especially in 2023, I learned and recognized all of my strengths that I've kind of neglected or just rubbed off. And I also realized that I wasn't speaking to myself in a way that I speak to my friends and family. And I had to sit back and think, if I spoke to anyone, like the way I speak to myself and the way I put myself down, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't have anyone because no one would want to be around that. So why am I doing that to myself? But it's a really surface level concept that had to be taken seriously with a, a psychologist in therapy. I don't know anybody who's been through what you've been through who hasn't been through great counseling and continues great counseling. In one way or another, I know that people get counseling when they choose to and when they're ready for it. I think Christina Anderson from Virginia Tech is frank about the fact that she didn't seek any counseling for maybe nine months. And, you know, she's doing well. You know, that's a kind of a question that people always ask, you know, how are you doing? Does that kind of annoy you if you have people ask you that all the time? How are you doing? No, I wouldn't say it annoys me. I was so, so against therapy. And I thought I didn't need it. I thought I was just going to like heal on my own and be fine. And my parents put me into therapy. I don't think it was even a week after the shooting because 
it, the change in my personality was so drastic. Of course, I wasn't qualified for PTSD at that point. It wasn't long enough, but they were so freaked out, honestly, because they were like, where is the Liz we know? Who is this new kid that isn't speaking, isn't sleeping, isn't talking? And they put me into therapy and I was so against it. I was so, I, I remember I showed up late to the office. I was crying. I did not want to speak to the therapist and it's the therapist I have to this day. She's the sweetest lady ever. And she saved my life, but it's just, I don't think if I went at that time in my life that I would have healed the way I, I did. I think I needed mm-hmm. to go that shortly after the shooting. That's great that your parents kind of helped you along. I'm sure there are people who don't have that kind of support. I imagine that as sad as it sounds, to say this, one of the things that I find in situations where there are a number of people who are killed or wounded, often it's a traumatic event. There's a lots of press coverage for it. There's lots of support for it. And I think that's the only good uh, thing that comes out of one of these types of shootings is that you are a community. Yeah, the community response was helpful. I remember I was constantly with a group of friends. But I remember being with those friends and we would all go to the school together when it was still closed. And we would just watch students from other schools who walk miles to march to Douglas. And I get goosebumps thinking about it because I remember I would just sit there and it was kids who were sweaty, red, and they were angry. And they weren't even at Douglas that day. And they were just a part of the South Florida community. And it was like, you're just as impacted. And it made me feel a lot less alone. But then I don't know at what point Parkland became so politicized and then the community was just divided uh, for the gun and mental health thing. And by the time we left that community in 2019, I was so happy to never go back and I've never been back. But it's so interesting because the response and healing to all of this, I feel like in every aspect is always just a very, very roller coaster and of course, I love Coral Springs and Parkland, and I'm so proud to have grown in that area. But I look back at it, and I don't know. I have a lot of mixed feelings about that area and that community. Are you angry at the fact that shootings are so politicized? I am angry. I would also say bitter. I feel like I've been so bitter for the past five years and it's it's gotten better but I just think about myself and my classmates and a bunch of other kids across the country who went to school and had no other choice but to run out because there was an active shooter there because we don't have the policies at local state and federal levels to just protect kids from getting shot in schools. I I just don't understand that because I feel like, I don't know. I feel like people just don't understand truly what happens in these classrooms, in these movie theaters, in these malls, in these grocery stores. I mean, I have to walk through the mall every day to get home and I'm like sprinting through it. And I always am like looking up because that's just the way I live now. And that makes me angry because that's normalized and it shouldn't be. If there was one thing that you could accomplish politically, you know, from a legislative standpoint, what's the one thing you'd like to see happen that you think might have an impact? Banning high capacity magazines. Because I was always the person that was just immediately a fan of assault rifles, but I didn't know what I was talking about. And along the way, and even my dad and other people were saying, it doesn't have to be an actual rifle to be an assault weapon. It could be something a lot smaller. Brooklyn, the shooting was six minutes long and 17 people were killed and 17 people were injured. That is not right. Why is that happening? It's evident that we're never going to ban any gun in the country. It's just, it's never going to happen. So I think we can try a- attacking a method of, of killing that people are doing with high capacity magazines. Mm-hmm. No, I understand. I mean, FBI agent, right? So I know what it's like to shoot with a high-capacity magazine. It's pretty darn effective.
So I did want to give you an opportunity to tell our audience about March for Our Lives. March for Our Lives was founded right after the shooting by several students at Stoneman Douglas. The thing about March for Our Lives is that those kids were so amazing in immediately trying to find a political solution and leading our school and leading our community. And I wanted to join them so bad, but I was in no mental or physical space to do that. And I was able to go to the big march in Washington, D.C. on March 24th, 2018. And it was so incredible to have our school be recognized at a national level for kids that just are not putting up with this crap anymore. And I loved having that recognition because I've, I was proud of my school. And then I feel like this doesn't get talked about. I'm kind of nervous. But it was interesting because none of those March for Lives kids were in the building. So in my opinion, they had the emotional tolerance to do all the interviews, do all the tours, do everything that was definitely needed at some political level. But then they started going on Dr. Phil, going on Ellen, getting on the cover of Time magazine. And at that point, I felt like, are are we forgetting what happened at, at Douglas? People were killed. People were mangled. There was a girl in my classroom who was shot in the head with an AR-15. And I feel like we're focusing a lot on the political activism and we're forgetting about those stories. And I am so grateful. And I think people like David Hogg are amazing. And I was a, the president of the March for Our Lives chapter at the University of Florida in Gainesville. But I feel like there's always so much focus on March for Our Lives, especially because in the D.C. area, it's really normal for people to say, hey, what do you do? Why are you here? What do you do for work? Whatever. And Parkland comes up in the conversation one way or another. And one of the first questions is always, do you know them? Do you know David? Do you know Emma? Do you know all these people? And why is that your first question? If I'm telling you there was a mass shooting and you're asking about potentially famous people or celebrity status people, why is that the the topic of conversation? And that's part of the reason why I feel like trigger therapy needs to come out because those details and nuances of what happened in the building itself are kind of forgotten. When you talk about triggering things for you, I would imagine that fireworks are not high on your list, both because of the smell and the sound. It's interesting that you talk about the smell because I feel like that's forgotten about. I was at a football game at the University of Central Florida, and I was still very much in that fight or flight and still kind of really, really uncomfortable in my body. And my family and I were tailgating. It was a great day. We're walking to the stadium for the football game to start. And fireworks just went off and there was no warning or anything. The place where my family was walking, it was like we were right next to them. And I had jumped and ducked for cover toward the ground. And it was so humiliating because I have friends behind me too. And other people who are like, is this girl doing? It's kind of degrading for me because it's like I had no control of what just happened like my body just did that I wasn't even thinking about it and then once it happened it's like what What? and that day was like the first time where I felt like okay I really have to like live my life almost without my own control and that was a really bizarre concept and I remember I went home that day and I felt really ashamed of myself and I was really beating myself up because I was just so embarrassed and that this is the life I live and I can't even go to a football game. And so now we take just preventative measures. I mean, I I did EMDR and had a lot of therapy to help with my PTSD, but I'll do the North cancellation headphones on the 4th of July for fireworks and stuff. But yeah, definitely that used to be a big trigger of mine, but not so much anymore. It's more of like, if I'm not expecting something that will freak me out, if I'm expecting it, then I'll be okay. You know, the other thing that's kind of falls in hand with that is, you probably don't see things the way you did before. It's a question of you change who you are, Mm -hmm. right? Do you feel like you just changed who you are and you're just learning how to accept who you are in this new skin? Yeah. I remember we went back to Stoneman Douglas 
two weeks after the shooting. Our first day back was February 28th. And I remember the days and weeks after, before I left, I would not focus on anything besides if someone does something, where am I going? There was no curriculum for me to focus on. I was entirely in a survival state at school. And it was bizarre because the teachers were really trying to like return to some normalcy and like really pushing the curriculum while, you know, students are going to Washington, D.C. to talk to President Trump. And it was just the most bizarre time. And the fact that I felt like I just wasn't even in my own body and I'm trying to learn this new Liz and I'm trying to survive in my classroom now, it was just very weird. I feel like those are a part of the reasons why I left Douglas overall and then just eventually left that community. It was just very, very overwhelming. I have different layers of survivor's guilt. And what comes up is I just imagine myself sitting in my my dorm, my freshman year of college. And I would just think about how there was a boy in our class who was shot, who I thought was having the asthma attack. And I don't remember if the shooter was at the end of the hall or going up to the second floor at that point, but he said, somebody help me. Can somebody help me? And the room was still silent. And so I just said, you have to be quiet. And then when I watched him get carried out, I was like, why did I tell him to be quiet? What was that? And that sentence alone, like, really messed me up for some time. But then there was also the fact that I felt like I left behind Carmen. And I felt like I could have done more. And then even just in the classroom, I wish, I remember, I wish I had gotten up and tended to the injured with my teacher and that boy. But I was just scared shitless, so I wasn't going to move. I remember I would tell these things to my therapist, feeling so guilty that I didn't do more and that I could have done more and whatever. And she said, you survived. You were talking to your family. You're talking to your friends. You were looking after yourself. You did everything you possibly could. Also, you were 17 years old. I don't know why you were putting so much pressure on yourself. Like All you did was go to school that day. And you were just following your regular lifestyle. I, I was just putting a lot of pressure and, and guilt on myself that I didn't do more to help. But then I feel like that, that discomfort and not necessarily guilt today, but I feel like there are more deserving people who should have platforms. And I remember I went to a Wear Orange event in June and I was going to speak at it. I did speak, but I was telling my sister who had organized this entire event that I felt like I shouldn't. And I felt like there was survivors who were better deserving of speaking. And it, people who grow up and live in Richmond, Virginia and see gun violence every day and live that life. And I was saying they need to speak because I've only had one individual event and then my life is gone. But these people deal with it every single day. And so it's just like, I feel like everywhere I can, I'll compare myself and just degrade my experience so that someone else can have a platform. You know, when you speak back to how you were just straight after the incident and you didn't yeah. have that moment or the power in you at that time to be the one that was speaking, you know, other people took the baton for you at that time and it'll be your time another time to take the baton and you don't know who you're helping by relieving them of that pressure to speak when they might not be ready to tell their story at that time. So I think you have to give yourself a little bit of grace there because... I think my mom said that verbatim, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is why Sarah and I do a podcast together because she's so articulate. I think that's from the Mum Playbook, page 26. Uh, that's, that's right. I remember after the shooting and throughout college, I was so uncomfortable being vulnerable, even to my therapist. I would hate crying in front of people growing up. And I was just, I hated it. But then I would say the last two or three years, I'm like, everybody, let's be vulnerable together. Let's just talk about all of our feelings and emotions. <laughs> and so I'm really trying to project that onto the podcast and just being a lot more comfortable with being vulnerable. And I, I think that 
that eventually translates into just evoking more empathy and compassion overall. So I guess my question to you would be, if you were talking to your 17-year-old self, what would you say? Oh, I love this question. Because I, I think about her every day, obviously. But I think I knew right away that I was an inherent storyteller and that I wanted people to know the story. And I flirted with the idea of a podcast for years. But life happens. Healing is hard. And now I'm finally at a place where I have the capacity to do it. And I think my 17-year-old self would just be like, yeah, we knew this was coming. You know, go girl. <laughs> I think that one of the phrases that I love about a show like yours and the concept is a phrase, all boats rise. Your podcast may be heard by somebody who is dealing with violence in their own home or violence from a school shooting. It's so many people in so many different situations, but all boats rise. You'll raise the awareness, the consciousness of everyone, no matter where their boat happens to be floating at that moment, whether they're the young 17-year-old who's afraid to talk to anybody and maybe just listens to your podcast, or somebody who's in therapy or providing therapy and listening to stories of people who have been through what you've been through. So I think it's a blessing that you can offer that. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I hope that awareness translates into reform at some level, at least, because I just don't want to raise awareness and it's stop there. I want it to actually move something and push some sort of social change at some level. What kind of changes? Talk to a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old. What can they do? What do you want them to do? There's so many activist programs across the country. And I think Becoming a part of a community effort is a great place to start. And then I think that way you just become more educated overall. I just think education is the key component, especially people at that, that age. And I mean, when I was 17, I wish I understood the entire political issue at hand more and how lobbyists played a role and how our policymakers play a role in things getting passed or not passed or whatever. I wish I understood that dynamic a lot more. So I would just say, Education overall is the number one thing. Liz, can you tell us what's the hardest part of all of this for you? I feel like I am still hard on myself, which I think just makes the entire experience a lot more difficult to heal from. Because sometimes I'll think like, why am I still, why am I still thinking about this? Why am I still talking about about this why am I even doing a podcast about it it's been five years kind of like get over it at this point type of dialogue but then all of other parts of me that are like this is who you are this is just what you became it's how you are dealing with the experience I feel like every other day is very different but I think the hardest thing for me is just being kind to myself and that's why eventually I want to do an entire episode on self-compassion because not that I've mastered it but learning about it and practicing it, it really does help the healing part, but it's so hard to master it. And it's so hard to like always or mostly be kind to yourself in really intense situations like this. Liz, is it realistic to think that you're going to get over this? Is that an unrealistic goal? I'll never get over it. And I, I, I say that and I think about if one day if I'm a mom and the day comes where I have to send my kid to school, I'm going to think about what happened in my classroom. I mean, I, I, I have little nieces and I think about them going to school and it freaks me out. And so I, I'll never get over it, but I'm always just like, why can't I just focus on something else? Why can't I just think about something else? Why can't my heart be somewhere else? But this is where it is. Thank you so much for joining us, Liz. I know that you have been a guest on my sister's podcast, The Bravery Academy, which is going to be coming out after the first episode of your podcast. So it's going to be a lot of wellness listening going on in my ears, I think, over the next couple of months, <laughs> which I'm really excited for. Where can we find your podcast? Trigger Therapy is on any platform where you listen to your podcast. So Apple Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen.
We're on Instagram at Trigger Therapy Podcast and any other inquiries can just go to Trigger Therapy Podcast at gmail.com. You are being kind to yourself. What are you most proud of that you've done in those years since that day? Oh, that's a really good question. I would say moving to the DC area. Once I got here, I eventually just had to start over on my own entirely. And like every day, like I'll just be sitting at my computer working and I'm like, oh, I did it. Like, <laughs> I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. And I feel like this is the place I need to be. And I think about college and just being in my dorm crying or feeling so insecure. And then I feel like it's just night and day where now I'm just so happy to be in this setting. And I'm also just incredibly proud of myself. And I do give myself the pat on the back that I deserve. Thanks for listening. And if you want to know more, Catherine's book, Stop the Killing, is out now. For more details, go to katherineschweit.com. Please consider also supporting our independently made podcast. It's simple to do. Go to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing. And for as little as the price of a latte a month, you can be part of the solution to stop the killing. Patreon rewards range from official do-gooder status to ad-free episodes, autographed books, and opportunities to connect with us directly for your business, school, church, or even just a book club chat. But just knowing that you are part of a movement that has the power to make your community safer, well, that's got to taste better than a skinny cappuccino any day. So please head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing now and polish off your do-gooder halo and make sure to include your name so we can give you a shout out. This podcast is a community podcast production. That's con with an N. If you want more content, then head over to Community Podcast at Instagram, where you'll find trailers on more binge-worthy true crime, like the award-winning podcast Conning the Con. And check out our show notes for all the links mentioned. Finally, if you want one takeaway action that you can do right now that can help make our community safer, Please share, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Everybody needs to know that they hold the keys to see something and say something. Together, we can stop the killing. It's one of those things you hope never happens, but you better train for it. Because it will happen. And it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it.